when you look at the show, there are times when we're biting our lips from laughing. I'm trying not to laugh, you know. We're like this and trying to say the line and listening. Oh, yeah, really? Well, that's it. Yeah. Irwin um, was very interested, of course, in uh, because he had been in advertising, he had been in journalism, he uh, he had uh, had his own advertising agency, so he really sort of had a, a finger on the pulse of what was going on during that that era. And of course, John Kennedy, in his inauguration, said that uh, he was going to put all these national resources into uh, the space program, get a man on the moon. And, um, and so 1965, when we did the show, the space program was really in sort of full throttle, so to speak. And, uh, uh, and it was a perfect time for a show like Lost in Space. Uh, I mean, it, it, the first year when it was in black and white was really um, much more science fiction than it was uh, in the second and third year where it became more of a science fantasy. And uh, I think people really were very interested, of course, uh, in, in the space program. And so it was also a show that people could sit down in front of their one TV, because most people only had one TV, and sit around as a family. And with the space program, um, uh, with such interest in the space program, I think it was a perfect timing uh, uh, that Irwin had uh, to, to put this show on the air. The second year when we went into color, there, Batman was opposite our show. And I think there was a strong need to make our show more of a cartoon, uh, like Batman. And so, we, I mean, we had our costumes were the colors of uh, cartoon colors. I mean, lavenders and oranges and golds and, and, uh, and greens. And uh, it, it had a real cartoony look the second and third year. And then, of course, Jonathan decided that his character would be offed somehow if he didn't make his character more interesting and not just the villain that he portrayed in the, in the first part of the, the first year. So he he became this, you know, ninny, this, this uh, villain with the, you know, this coward, cowardly lion kind of person who, who uh, was very easy to write for. And um, he was very smart in that way because Jonathan, I knew, would sit up every night and write his dialogue. And, and, um, uh, and the writers would, of course, be very thankful because Jonathan was a wonderful character actor, and he knew how to present himself as this character. He knew just how to, um, like, he, like he, he took Martita Hunt's voice, you know, uh, from the Mad Woman of Shion, and, and uh, he had worked with her on stage. And so he, he started building this character that was really very easy to write for, easy to present, easy to, to uh, make, in, um, make the sort of silly tongue-in-cheek style that Batman uh, uh, was uh, uh, representing. So I, I think it was hard for some of us. I mean, right now, I, I'm certainly, I'm not regretting any, any thing that happened because it, I mean, look, here I am sitting talking about Lost in Space. <laughs> so I have no regrets. I did at that time, however. I felt uh, Irwin had promised that I would have a lot to do. I, because originally I said, I don't want to do this show because I know what's going to happen. I'm just going to be part of this whole group. And I felt I had a very going career at the time. I was doing a lot of drama and a lot of, you know, like Emmy-winning, award-winning shows. And, and uh, so Irwin said, no, 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 absolutely. I have storylines. You and Dawn, you're going to have a romance. Everything's, everything is set. Don't you worry. And he called me for two weeks and asked me to do this show because he said, ah, you're the one. And that was one of Irwin's, I think, geniuses is that that he was able to cast very well. Because on television, you cannot have rehearsal. You have to know what you're doing, and you have to know your part, and you have to be ready and, and, uh, and uh, uh, set ready and, and line ready. And, uh, and so Irwin knew that he wanted me, 
and um, because he he saw my film and and he knew that I could do it and um, but I was disappointed that I didn't have any more to do than I did and at that time but now of course I'm not they say that Irwin had more um, well he he was what is it uh, style over substance, you know, that he had, he really knew what it was he wanted to do, wanted to show in terms of the uh, disaster uh, part of the show and all of the special effects and, you know, uh, all of the uh, crashing and booming and, and, and uh, 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 the disaster part of, of the show. He really didn't have an idea of of what an actor, like about a char characterization. Um, I don't think he was a real people person in that way. You know, I, I don't think he had, uh, I know he got married later on in life, and I think he had, he had a few relationships, but I don't think he was a real family-oriented person. And, and so, I, even though, even though uh, the show, I think, was sort of a, a leave it to beaver in space in some ways, because we had, we had, a lot of connections with the family and the sweetness and, and the, 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 um, the connection with each other and, and an idealized family, not really, uh, uh, the fa not the family that was, that was uh, in real life. Uh, if I may say, one of the strange things was driving into work uh, at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, which I loved doing because I love the morning, and going on set. And being with this, you know, this space family all day, and portraying this wonderful—I mean, sort of silly in the you know latter part of the show, sort of silliness—and and having really a lot of fun on the set. I mean, we played Scrabble and we, a killer Scrabble, June and Guy. Ah, oh, they, they. I mean, you know, 500 points for one word. I mean, they were amazing, and uh, we had a good time. But then going home and then watching the news and watching the war and. Um, and and the, the pop culture that was just uh, uh, being born, you know, I, it was an exciting and vibrant time and, and, and a very sad time, I mean, a very chaotic time. And to go home from this loving family in Lost in Space on the set to this chaos in a way at home and uh, trying to fit into, you know, being a hippie and, and uh, you know, uh, all of the other things that were going on. And I, I'm an artist as well, so I really wanted to be a part of that. So I'd go to Venice on weekends with my friends and we'd all do our art and do our happenings. <clears throat> and then, on, you know, Monday morning I'd be back on the set. It was like being in a little cocoon in a way. It was a very different world. And, um, and I had one foot in both of them. And, uh, uh, you know, my, I was married at the time to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and he worked for the Veterans Administration. And I would go to the VA, and I would see these wounded and horribly uh, damaged people. And, uh, you know, and I would talk to them, and, and they, they so much loved Lost in Space. And, and, uh, but these were these young, you know, fresh-faced boys and girls that were you know, from coming from Vietnam. And so it was, it was a very, very strange era for me. And uh, having both feet in, in, in one family uh, that was uh, so um, fantastical and, and the other uh, foot in, in the real world. I do want to say that in, and I think the American public wanted something that would take them away from, from, Viet, from the war from all of the, uh, the chaos that was going on outside uh, of their lives and, and within their homes as well. And I, you know, so Lost in Space had a role to play and to, to, bring, to bring that kind of fantasy to them and to let them escape for an hour. And it really was an escape. I mean, it was quite, it was fun. I mean, and the kids loved it. I mean, the children, I, I now meet people who just, I, they smile so broadly. They just shine when, when they meet us from Lost in Space because they said that was such a, a wonderful time for them when they sat down with their families and watched it. And because it, because it had this fantasy and they were children. And, and that was another genius that uh, Irwin Allen had. Uh, part of his genius was that he was able to take the inner child in all of us and, and, uh, and create television programs out of it, like Land of the Giants, for instance. I mean, 
little kids, they all think everything is big. Um, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, you know, all these sea monsters. I mean, we all sort of feel like the hairy hand is going to come and get us at some point when we're in the ocean. Um, um, a time tunnel, we all want to travel back and forth. I mean, who wouldn't? And uh, so Irwin really, really was quite a genius at, at doing, at, at, at uh, finding these fantasies that each of us have as a, you know, the child in us. He loved coming on the set. And um, he had, uh, I'm sure other people have told you about this, that he had a, 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 a basket, a waste paper basket, metal one. And for, for instance, on, in the pilot, we were in the chariot, which was our, our vehicle. And we were on the sea in the chariot. And we were supposed to be going back and forth and water pouring in on us. And there was never enough water. He would say, more water. And we'd all get soaked, you know. We'd, oh, no, not again. And he took a hammer and this waste paper basket. And every time we were supposed to, we were on a gimbal. And every time we were supposed to go from one side to the other, he'd hit the hammer onto the waste paper basket. And we'd all move one way and then the other. And, uh, and he loved it more than anyone. I'm surprised he didn't have a gun, you know, to shoot off, you know. But he, he did. He loved it. And he was a bit, bit of a kid. But he ruled with an iron fist. He was very, very um, uh, tough when he came down on the set when he didn't think things were going right. And he would, he would once in a while dismiss one of us, you know, saying, you know, you're going to, uh, you're not going to be in the next episode because uh, he didn't like the way. It never happened to me, of course. I think he wanted it to be a show about monsters and about mm, the robot, and he didn't want to deal with uh, these emotions that you know that would uh, cause other problems. Although, for me, I, when I told him, I, I was really upset that I wasn't getting more to do. So I went up to his office and I said, "Erwin, you know, you haven't done what you promised." You told me I was going to get storyline after storyline. He said, Mata, he said, you're absolutely right. I'm, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm going to give you more to do. Well, that week I had only had, I think, one line said, Will? So the next week I get the script and I have, Will? Penny? I mean, yeah, it's a silly story, but but it, it you know it's true. It, it, he just he didn't um, he didn't know how to write. I think for me, he didn't know he didn't know what to do with my character once he once the space family Robinson idea became more about the robot and about uh, about uh, Will and and Doctor Smith. The, the family sort of went uh, by and by, and and um, and so. Uh, I, we were all left sort of uh, hanging about, you know, what, what are we going to do? Where, you know, wh what about what about me? There was, you know, uh, uh, little silly things, you know, that that occurred. But other than that, we all got along really well. And uh, frankly, Billy was my best friend on the set. I mean, um, I introduced him to Dylan and, you know, music, Donovan, and, and uh, he played the guitar, and we sang Sloop John B. on the show. And, um, and we'd go, and Billy, Angela, and myself, and Mark, once in a while, would go and play. Uh, I was young enough to, to enjoy that. I still do. But <laughs> uh, we would, um, like, go under the tunnels under 20th Century Fox. And it was like... Uh, a, uh, wonderfully spooky and scary and, and cobwebby and, and uh, we'd go there during lunch and uh, we, we'd have uh, Mark would bring peanuts back from, uh, from the restaurant that uh, we would go to and, and he would throw them down off the catwalk to the crew and people would be lifting their heads and trying to catch them with their mouths and, I mean, we had a good time, we had fun on the set I mean there was a little bit of bickering but maybe Jonathan had a little bit of, of uh, animosity for a few people, but other than that, he, uh, he was one of my dear, dear friends. And, and uh, until he passed away, we, we were still very, very close. <laughs> the Great Vegetable Rebellion. Well, I remember Mark Goddard saying, seven years, seven years of Stanislavski, 
Seven years of method acting, and I'm talking to a carrot? <laughs> it was, I, it really sort of was the, the beginning of the end, in, in a way, for us. Uh, it was one of the last, last shows we did, but I frankly had such a fun time. I thought nothing could be so silly as vegetables running around and uh, painted orange, the faces painting orange. Uh, I mean, uh, when you look at the show, there are times when we're biting our lips from laughing. I'm trying not to laugh, you know. We're like this and trying to say the line and listening, oh yeah, really, well, that's it. And we're biting our lips so that we're not breaking up and Irwin doesn't come down and say, time is money, time is money. I mean, really, talking to a carrot. And Jonathan, there was a, um, a llama that was, not, not a religious person, but, you know, um, a, a llama that was supposed to be on the show. And uh, Wil Wilbur was supposed to be the llama. But it kept hissing and attacking Jonathan for some reason. But Jonathan had all the celery over him. And it, the, the poor, that animal kept going after the celery on and, and Jonathan. And Jonathan and I said, I'm not going to work with the llama, uh, you know. So the llama was out. Angela, Bill, and myself were invited to NASA, invited to Florida, and to the NASA Space Center. And we were so thrilled to be invited. And we're walking around, and people are coming up to us. Scientists are coming up to us and saying, we loved Lost in Space. You inspired us to go into science, into the sciences, into space science. You know, and I'm thinking, <clears throat> oh my gosh, wow, I'm so flattered. But, you know, I, I was awed by them. And for them to come up to me and, and ask for my autograph and say that they were uh, so in influenced by, by Lost in Space uh, as a child that they went into, into space science. I, to, to me, it was just a, an unbelievable uh, time and moment for, for me. It is a powerful medium. And, and uh, I, I, and Irwin knew that. I mean, you know, Irwin had, <clears throat> having had an advertising agency, you know, he knew he knew where people would find a connection, and um, and and we certainly didn't know that we would have that kind of influence in the years to come. And I meet people now who say that um, uh, uh, they they were they were so happy when uh, Lost in Space came on and that, uh, that they would play in their backyards. You know, somebody would be uh, Judy and another person would be Will and, you know, and they'd be playing Lost in Space. And, uh, and those were just great memories for these people. And, and um, you know, I, and I, I'm always very flattered that, um, that, that we had that, uh, we made that mark. <laughs> I remember no one called. I heard it. I heard it through. Hmm, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, obviously, someone called, but no one from the studio called. I think it was Bill who called me and said, "You know, we're canceled." And I said, "No, can't be," because we had all planned to come back the next year. My understanding is that Irwin had some kind of battle with the network, and he didn't give the um, storylines that he was supposed to. Like he was supposed to give them ten storylines for uh, the first ten uh, for the, to the network, and uh, because he didn't do that, they just said the head of the network said, "Well, fine, okay, you're canceled." Of course, now nowadays that would never happen because it, there's so many people making a decision about what goes on and what goes off, and and, um, and even though we always had good good um, uh, good viewership, you know, we always had. We're always in the top 25, so it was, uh, it was a real shock. We were all very disappointed. What I did was I started a family. <clears throat> I had a daughter, and then I started uh, doing commercials. I've done about 40-some commercials. Um, and I started a theater company with a group called the West Coast Ensemble, which is where my heart had always been. I always loved the theater. I started in theater. I, I, every actor says that, right? Ah, oh, the theater. Well. Um, it's true. It's true. The theater is a place where you can really hone your craft and, um, and create 
a whole nother life when you get on stage. And it's, it's, it's the most awe-inspiring thing to all of a sudden be on, on stage and you know you have that whole audience with you. It's amazing. The last play I did was uh, Wings and uh, uh, about a stroke vi victim, uh, Emily Stilson, who was, had been a wing walker. And it was, it's just a fabulous play. At USC uh, School of Music got involved and they did music for the play and the film department did film, film for the play. I mean, it was an experimental play, but it was astounding. It was just, it was just amazing. And, and in, in film, it's a completely different medium where you, you know, you have to bring everything down. Everything has to be sh shown in your eyes and, and very, very small expression and because you don't need large ones, but, um, uh, I, and, and, and there's a great art to film acting. Um, but theater is, is at times more fun. I think that Westerns were, <clears throat> I mean, we all always are dealing with the good guys and the bad guys. And Westerns had, uh, you know, a very strong uh, line, uh, demarcation uh, between the two. And so it was easy to write for, you know, outside horses. I mean, I love horses. I grew up with horses. I was always hanging around the stables, which my mother didn't particularly like, but uh, she didn't think it was proper. But um, uh, I was always an outdoor person, always a tomboy. And so um, I loved doing westerns. I loved being outside. Savage Sam, for instance. I was outside the whole time. We did nothing on stage, on, in, in, a, in a set. And um, uh, <laughs> there were so many things that happened on that show. There was one point in Savage Sam where I was being led by an Indian and I was sitting on the horse and he had, the actor had the reins and he was never supposed to drop the reins while I was on the horse. He dropped the reins and something spooked my horse and the horse with me on top took off and went up a hill right towards an oak tree on the top of the hill. This was in Calabasas. And I had, since I'd grown up with horses, I, I pretty much knew just to lean forward and hold on to the mane. And when I get scared, I get like hysterically, <clears throat> I hysterically laugh. And so I started laughing and laughing and laughing. And because I knew the horse was aiming to get me off that, <clears throat> off him by going to the tree. I, I don't know what, I mean, I, I thought that he, he was going to go under the branch and get me off, uh, you know. Horses are very smart, very smart. And so um, the horse, as soon as I got to the top, stopped. Immediately, it just stopped. And I like half fell off. And, I, and as I regained composure, I turned around and there's like the whole crew running up this hill. And they're saying, are you all right? Are you, are you all right? And I'm la I was laughing. And, la and then, I, of course, I, you know, oh, my God, I, you know, practically got killed. But yeah, when you're around horses, this is what happens. Uh, but I loved working with the cowboys and the, the wranglers. And um, I learned stunt, stunt um, uh, some uh, tricks, horse, you know, horse tricks, where they would, I would be standing, and they would be riding by, and they'd throw me, pick me up and throw me behind them. And... Um, uh, there's a story about Walt Disney for doing Savage Sam. I had <clears throat> this was my first film, and I went through the whole audition process. And the last person I was to meet was Walt Disney, and we all had dinner in uh, his special room in the commissary. And there were like five five other people and my mother, and I didn't say anything because I was just you know my face was like beet red. I was so nervous. And I didn't want to eat. My mouth was dry, but I finally forced myself to take a bite of salad. And as soon as I did that, Mr. Disney asked a question. <laughs> so are you interested in playing Liz? And I breathed in, and I started choking. And, you know, it was, I, I just wanted to crawl under the table, just die. And my mother's patting me on the back. But <clears throat> Walt Disney just said, are you all right? Is it OK? get some water, are you okay, you know, and, and then we just, uh, went, once I gained my composure, <laughs> I, I was uh, able to talk with him, but I was so embarrassed. Oh, listen, I, I know that 
there was a kind of sexuality that I had in Lost in Space that came from the innocence um, that uh, I really had. And I was raised in the Midwest. I had that Midwest um, sensibility about, about myself. I had no idea that I was sexual or sensual or uh, I had no idea. And so, frankly, I had, I, I, it was like walking with blinders when I was a young, young person. I, I wish I had known the power that, <laughs> that I could have had. I had no idea. And, um, I, and I got married very early. And uh, so my, my life uh, really was, uh, my home life was centered around that. Um, I, I mean, I knew in a way that uh, um, I, I was attractive. And, and um, I mean, uh, the producer of Lolita was uh, you know the person who who uh, discovered quote unquote discovered me even though I'd been doing acting for ever since I was a little girl, but uh, he saw yeah, that that sensuality that uh, that I had and now when I look and, and and watch the shows that I did, it definitely is there, but um, I didn't know the power that I could have had. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. My favorite experience was working with Tony Dow in uh, a first two-parter on television called um, Four Feet in the Morning. And uh, it was, I believe we filmed it in 1963. Um, and it was a show about teenage pregnancy and about abortion. And this was a time when, I think Lucy had shown her pregnancy on television in the 50s, but uh, you did, couldn't say pregnant, and certainly you didn't talk about abortion, and you didn't talk about um, uh, a teenage pregnancy and teenage uh, uh, relationships that uh, involved that. Everything was very, very, um, uh, I would say, they were in denial that anything like this happened and it didn't, it wasn't represented on television. And that was an incredible experience because Jack Smite directed it and it, um, uh, it, it portrayed a certain kind of desperation and loneliness that young people had when they were in that circumstance. And that to me is what entertainment really is about. I mean, it's about connecting, how, how the viewer connects to the experience that you're representing on television and, and, and as the actor. If you, can, if you can at least give some kind of, of, um, of uh, encouragement and a less, maybe a lesson. I, I think we all had, uh, on Lost in Space, we had uh, every, di every, every, every show had some kind of moral uh, mor uh, lesson in, 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 uh, in the show. And, uh, and, and it was about ethics and about how you treat people. And, and that's what life is, for me, about. It's how you connect with people and how, how, how do you open up to people. How, like in, um, I've traveled a lot to Asia. And uh, namaste, which is the uh, word for hello, um, really is, a, a, it's like aloha, it's hello, goodbye, but it's also I salute the God within you. And, and, um, and that's what uh, I, I'm hoping that uh, at the end of my life I can say I've done.